Welcome back to the X Podcast. I am here with Zachary Brown and Timothy Moore. I wonder where that was going. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for a nickname. Yeah, yeah I almost went into Timothy LeVay, but I Don't I, do that. I, well, I stopped myself. Yeah. Oh, I stopped oh, myself. How are we doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I mean, it's, you know, end of February and uh, it's about 60 degrees and sunny, so it's either apocalyptic, global warming, or I'm dreaming. What is it? Both? Apocalyptic. Uh, Global warming. warming or you're dreaming. I just read that. Guess would have to be one of the first two because I don't think you're dreaming because it's that warm. <laughs> I just read that there's a big ice shelf in Antarctica that is falling falling off. Like yep, that and apparently there's a current. Uh, there's an ocean current that's about uh, to shift. You read about that too. Change all of the globe's temperatures. Why would that happen? That's not there, true. There's huh? no that's true. <laughs> what? Where are you reading? Because you, where are you getting your news from? And there's also like what thirty things are getting colder. Record temperatures that were broken. Um, like, this like getting colder because it's winter. <laughs> the missing winter. Of what the are we talking about? You know, I don't know. It's not real. So who knows? All I know is it's going to be 70 next week. Did you see? It's supposed to be yeah. in the 70s. Yep. Here yeah. or it's on Sunday. Here. Yeah. On oh Sunday. My gosh. On Sunday. It's, it's supposed like to be 71. upper 60s or 70. I saw Monday. It's supposed to be 70 some That's degrees next week. So. Hey, there are some advantages to global warming <laughs> when you live in the north. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, it's in the winter time. That's all I'm going to say about that. Mm-hmm. Feels weird, but it feels great. It does. Love um, it. Yep. 100 years from now, our Earth will be cur- cursing us. But I saw a movie last night. Did y'all ever see Fury? Uh, is that the Brad Pitt? Fury? Yeah. In the Tank I, oh, World oh, War yeah, II I movie? Oh, yeah, I did see that. Yeah. I saw old. it one time in theaters, but it was a long time ago. Long time ago. Man. It was that, grisly, but it was good. That movie's got to be like 15 years old, right? Uh, 10 years old. Uh, you know? on the, it uh, just hit Netflix, and okay. I've never seen it for some it's reason. Good. It's good. Uh, on the span of movie stars that you'd want to maybe emulate, where does or maybe look like? Where's Brad Pitt fit? Oh, he's number oh, one, near the very yeah, top. Yeah, for, for sure. you, number one. Oh yeah, Brad what? Pitt is one like one of those people Brad that Pitt like when you see him in a movie, he's just like he's just epic. Like everything he does. Okay, is favorite epic. Brad Pitt role. Oh my, how do you do that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think Ocean's Eleven. Ocean's. Is just I was gonna iconic. say. I was but, gonna say Ocean's. But he's great at different ones because like part of me wants to say Ocean's Eleven, part of me wants to say Troy. Troy, who's great in Troy? Achilles. Yeah, I mean, I want to look like he looked yeah, like in yeah. Troy and, you know, just be as smooth as he was. It's and, not fair, uh, isn't it? It's not. What if you could have Brad Pitt's face <laughs> with uh, Chris Helmsworth's body? <laughs> is it Chris? Is he the big yeah. one? Is he the one that did Thor? Thor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I told you. Also not a bad looking guy. But here's the thing. I'm allowed to say I, that. Is I that would, weird? I would, I would not go <laughs> any of those two. Okay. I would go Hugh Jackman. Because what from Wolverine? Yeah, he can not just Wolverine, but he has won multiple Tony awards for his singing ability, acting ability. We don't ability. care about that. No, we no, were just he, talking he about can, looks. You just love him because he does puzzles. No, he yeah. can sing and act, uh, but he's also Wolverine and looks. That's who you are. Jacked and amazing. Uh, like, I uh, think, Wolverine's I think pretty Thor's cool. A little like Although I told you, you want to be Aquaman. Uh you know, my first time ever seeing him was in How I Met Your Mother. No, you don't, no, you don't like. <laughs> he was in there, you Jason. You don't like what's his Momoa. Name? Momoa. Momoa. You don't like any superhero stuff at all. That's not true. I just, I'm not obsessed with it like weirdos are. Yeah, um, I agree with him. I'm not either. But I told you, Chris Hemsworth's brother was Land in a great Liam. movie I saw in theaters. What yeah. was it called? Land of Bad. Land of, it was great. Land of Bad, yeah. Funny, you know, little factoid. Apparently, um, today's episode is going to be movie reviews yeah. of which movie star you'd like to look like. <laughs> when I think I told you, there's this, there's this place in. Atlanta called Atlanta Fish Market, one of the best restaurants, and girl I dated worked there, and one time she texted me, she goes, hey, I just got to tell you, the Hemsworth brothers just walked in, and I got pictures with both of them hugging me, and I said, I do not blame you. I said, that is amazing. <laughs> I would want to be hugged by Thor, too. I would want to yeah. be hugged. Liam, but maybe not so much. I think they were both oh, in the- Liam. Really? Yeah. He just looks like both. his scrawny little brother that's- oh Yeah. They were both- There's just something about- Yeah. Both the brothers were in the remake of the Red Dawn movie. You remember the Red Dawn oh, that yeah. came it out? Just, it's so hard to – yeah. We talked about that before, and I'm yep. like, the original Red Dawn is hard to beat, though, partially from nostalgia. Growing up watching that. <laughs> that was like your movie, thing. You know, it, was, it freaked you out. Did you, you watch out. the new one? Yeah, I saw it. That yeah. was like uh, also 10 years ago or more, yeah, right? It yeah, it like wasn't that great. Recent. I think I think what made the Red Dawn in the 80s so there, – there was a realism mm-hmm. because of the Cold War that was going on that you literally thought we could be in war with Russia someday. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting uh, since our podcast last week on Russia, yeah. the day after we recorded it, um, president Biden did like 
I mean, the first huge round of sanctions yeah. against in Russia yeah. in years, which I'm sure that people debate on how yeah. much effect that's going to have. But interesting. Yep. Okay, so all things. So uh, Brad Pitt, Chris Hemsworth, Hugh Jackman. You guys tell us which one's <laughs> the best. <laughs> but, oh. I mean, Brad Pitt just doesn't even age. He just doesn't he age. Did, there's, there's a Wolverine few actors literally and never dies. That don't age. Okay. Well, Jennifer Lopez does not age. She does not age a lot at all. Jennifer Aniston. Actually, also. I saw a picture of Christy Brinkley the other day. You want to talk about someone who's seventy years old but does not look seventy? That's that's someone who can age. I think I, uh, I no, I didn't tell you. Uh, my sister casually mentioned uh, when I was in Denver that uh, my niece was over at Jennifer Lopez's house the other day. No, oh. for that's little, just you know. Because uh, they were doing like a music video for some dance shoot, and she was like one of the few picked, and so she literally they did it at Jennifer Lopez's house. I was like, "Was it uh, kind of nice?" She's, like, "Yeah, oh, I'm sure it was." Yeah. Uh, yeah. And let's be honest, the reason why most of them don't age is because most of them are getting Botox <laughs> and all kinds of other treatments. We that do know be, that, that, right? That would be an interesting conversation. Actually. I think we should bring Ageism. someone. I have someone. We should bring someone on the podcast who gives us Botox while talking about it. <laughs> How interesting would it be if, like, we no longer could move our foreheads and we would just <laughs> while we're talking you, about both, that would be I would love it than most people. I don't know why. <laughs> Although tragically, I be. saw I have lines because my forehead moves. You get some lines I too. Still I, think, I'm telling you, I it's still bad. think I'm, one of the best podcasts I get lines? that you guys yeah, ever did. A little bit You're, when you wrinkle like I do. Look, yeah, yeah a little bit. You're talking to me or him? Yeah. But both. You. He doesn't. His forehead, his forehead doesn't line. It just like. I'm just, it's just wide. This is you know what's sad. This is the oddest saw, podcast. I, Matt, I is, apologize right I, now. We were supposed to talk about something. And, I saw. I did see this article that was really depressing. That talked about all of the advertised like creams and ointments that are like anti aging, like for skin and wrinkles, have almost zero effect. Yeah, I just saw that. I don't know how true that is. I think is. it's actually pretty true. I think most of the people that you see that have aged gracefully, scam. I think they're having. Stuff done. Surgery. They say you're no. I think that skincare. Talk. Skincare is real. It does help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, this is we need to move on. We need to move yeah. on. Um, you brought some uh, paper money. What do you mean? Up to the table. It's Why is that? The, the I didn't bring anything. More money, more problems. These, these look really real. I know they are real. What do you mean? Uh, these are Benjamins. They're they're Benjamins. All right. So we've been in a Sunday series on money, called Money Moves. You originally wanted to call it Money Talks. And then we were like, no, let's call it Money Moves. So we called it Money Moves. I don't remember saying I was going to call it Money Talks. Yeah, I made that part up. Okay. But, um, <laughs> and it's a, it's, it's a series about, uh, we believe God's heart to help everybody win with money. Yeah. And to not let money control us. And All you have to do is print it. All you have to do is print it. You brought up some amazing stuff and you've had fun with it i mean for it's 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 not always the most fun to have to talk about money we've although tried to make it fun every week we've tried to make it fun even though it is really important people don't realize that it is actually the topic that jesus mentioned more in the new testament mm-hmm. than any other topic um and it is connected to our hearts and it we all think about it yeah right but there's something really weird and taboo that even though people talk about it at the water cooler at the gym at home in the car Listen to people talk about on TikTok. If you say the word money in church, <gasps> yeah. there's like this weird, like taboo gasp. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's connected to all kind of stereotypes and maybe bad experiences or whatever, but it matters. And so um, we talk about it. And uh, you just brought up some powerful concepts like first fruits for those that are in the faith mm-hmm. context, a powerful way to actually put first things first yeah. in our lives, prioritize. Um, but you tackled a topic this past Sunday that's really interesting. You don't hear a lot of people tackle in the faith space, and it's the tension of being rich. Yeah. And are we rich? Is it okay to be rich? Yeah. What is rich? What is rich? You brought up, you know, you contextualize globally that mm. most vast majority of people in America are rich. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not just um, because we have shelter. Most people in yeah. America have shelter food to eat mm-hmm. um but you know what, what are some of the statistics if if you're if you make minimum wage in ohio yep. and you don't have kids mm-hmm. then you are in the what top 97 no you're um doing better than 91.3 percent 91.3 percent of people in the world that's yeah. crazy, that is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. and that's that's yeah. not a lot what does that tell you i mean yeah that's ten dollars and 45 cents an hour it's funny i mentioned that 
Ohio had just raised it because I looked it up and it said they just raised it. I didn't even realize they'd raised it to ten dollars and forty five cents an hour in the oh, state of really? Ohio. And it was and I when you I pulled it up and did a search, it said that it took effect like January something of twenty four. And I had I had a few people, college students, approach me afterward to go, Hey, where'd you get that information about uh the you know, hourly wage for, you know, minimum wage? And I said, Well, I just searched it, they just changed the law, but I was like yeah, because we I make nine dollars an hour. I said, well, it doesn't apply to what, what is it called, like tip wage earners, so yeah. that. And they're like, no, we don't earn tips. I'm like, well, if it were me, I'd probably print out the the new law and I'd take <laughs> it into my employer tomorrow and say, have you seen this? <laughs> That's you know? crazy. Yeah, and so it's relatively new. But again, you're going to get business owners thrown in jail. No, I'm sorry. But if you are <laughs> minimum wage, uh, you are doing better than over 91 percent of the world when it comes to income and. Some of the other ones, if you're making forty thousand mm. dollars a year as a single, you're doing you're in the top three percent. Mm. And then you talk about breaking up with your money, and it's funny because um, Zachary or sent a text, and he's like, "What if you're like me and you have eleven kids? Um, how does that four, factor in?" Four. Yeah. And we said, "Well, you're gonna break up with money and some kids. You need to break up with some money and your kids." <laughs> mm. I told my wife that she didn't find it amusing. <laughs> she didn't find it amusing. <laughs> no. I think it's amusing. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyways. No, it's it's it's. It is a very interesting tension, and I, and I, I felt, I, I felt like it was really hard to, to, I, I took a little extra time, it was a little bit longer in the second experience, because mm -hmm. I really wanted to give the counter to, you know, it's the desire for riches that can actually be a trap. Mm -hmm. it, it's you know that longing. It's like where where you're chasing after something that you can't really ever catch. Being rich is not bad. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can become rich. And again, there's rich, and I tried to express it. There's rich on a global scale, mm -hmm. but then there's context, right? You mm -hmm. can, you know, you can make uh, um, forty thousand dollars a year in some places, even in America, and you can be doing okay. Mm -hmm. If you're single, you could maybe afford an apartment. You maybe, uh, you know, this. You make forty thousand dollars a year in LA. Mm -hmm. You are probably rooming up with three other people and taking the bus. Mm -hmm. Right. Just cost of living. So yep. there's context for everything. And, and I think the biggest thing is that most of us, we don't feel rich. Mm -hmm. And the trap is that you cannot feel rich making forty thousand dollars a year. You can also not feel rich making two hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. It, maybe not <coughs> as related. It just comes to my mind. What do you think the new bell curve is with inflation and cost of living? Depends on where you live, I'm sure. Yeah. What do you think the new bell curve is as far as the whole like? This amount of money is happiness, but then because it used to be there seventy thousand dollars, they yeah. used to say, "Hey, there if you make one. seventy thousand dollars, um, then um, your cost of living gets happier." But after seventy thousand, there's a, what there's, they're saying is that there's a tipping point. Yes, on income, that once you get to a certain point, there's a certain amount of it's like, a bell curve. You, yeah, of having your, you know, you have your needs met, you're able to do some things mm -hmm. that are nice, you have some comfort. Once you reach that point, I don't even know if I, I don't know if it was is totally a bell curve. I mean, bell curve is you hit that point and then it's downhill it from downhill. there. And I don't know if it's necessarily downhill and if 70 some thousand is the, the top, it's just what they have found is I don't think people's, they have not been able to measure that people's happiness increases beyond it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's almost yeah. like a shelf that is, it may not fall off. I but mean, I feel like some people would argue your problems get worse. Well, and the tension gets worse. Potentially, and the stress gets worse. potentially that's true. But, I, but I think it's, what do you think it'd be now? I feel like it'd be closer to 90. I actually read, Recently, that it's over a hundred thousand. Hmm. Uh, in order, like for a family of four to be able to pay their mortgage, have a car payment, pay off minimal credit card debt, put kids through school expenses, like just like basic living, family of four hundred thousand. Oh, I guess I was just thinking for a single person. Oh, so no. yeah, I don't know. Is that was that stat that stat single seventy probably? I could see that. I, yeah, I, assume. I, I bet you combined, it's probably got to be well over a hundred to one hundred twenty thousand. I, I just think yeah. you hear one hundred twenty thousand. That seemed like a lot a long time ago. It was, mm -hmm. but I think that's almost for two people. Let's just say that they're maybe they're not right out of college, but let's just say two people in their late twenties or thirties. If they're maybe working in a job or a career, maybe they went to school. That's not a stretch at all. Mm -hmm. That's not you know in their thirties or whatever. That's not a stretch for two yeah. people. If if you have double income. You know, yeah. So I, I think a hundred to one hundred twenty thousand dollars is probably what you know is probably that comfort yeah. zone. 
for for when I'd say more families, right? Where they get into that. But I think all of that has to do with how much debt you've incurred. I think yeah. it's the decisions yeah. that you've made that really yeah. dictates what that where mm-hmm. you need to be to have some kind of peace yeah. of mind. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, look, the one question I wanted to ask you from mm-hmm. Sunday, I'm just curious um, your response. So like, I definitely agree with you that the love of money, the love of wealth, riches, that's not what we want. Um, how do you balance that with like a desire to provide for your family, have nice experiences, to live a certain like what's like t- talk me through practically how yeah. to navigate that tension? Okay, I think one thing. Let me just say in in my own life and a couple things. I think there's two words that come to my mind that I think can can really put the whole thing together where you can have peace. That'd be the third one, but the first one is priorities. I think it, to me, where I have found a freedom is that when I prioritize um, operating the money that God's entrusted me with in his methods, in his ways, when I, when I know that I'm giving God at least the first 10%, like that, there is a freedom that I don't stress and worry about, you know, not, I'm not saying stress and worry about bills. I'm, I like, I want to manage the other 90 well, yeah. but I also... I feel like that that practice in my life is the thing that really does uh, remove that drive for riches. Mm-hmm. There, there's something about it, like it does that. And it's coupled with another thing, but I think priorities. There's a freedom that I feel like, hey, if if we're able to earn and and I'm able to make more money and I'm able to provide more things, not just for me, but I start thinking, you know, you have a grandchild, you start thinking, I mean, it's one of the things that, that Lorelai and I are already talking about. I, I talked about this with you and I love the mm-hmm. idea. I think it was like your parents or one of them yep. were doing this mom, and that yeah. is, we want to start now like birthdays or certain things. We want to start putting some money away in like some kind of trust thing for mm-hmm. Cohen. And scripture actually talks about that the, the real goal I mm-hmm. think for every person, the real blessing is not to hand your money down to your kids, but to your grandkids. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so I, I want to think now, you know, we have mm-hmm. an opportunity now to start going, how do we do stuff with our grandkids? I talked to mm-hmm. another pastor um, the, um, a couple weeks ago, and I just, I love this perspective. Uh, I don't know that we have the resources to do all the stuff that he's doing right now, but he, they, him and his wife, have, they have lots of grandchildren now, and they have really made it a priority with all of their grandchildren that when they reach a certain age, they take them on a trip. They do certain Love things that. with their grandchildren. And so I want to be in a position to do that. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If mm-hmm. I, here's what I'd say. Priorities matter. So if I have my, my priorities in alignment, I'm not going to stress. I'm not worried as much about the idea of like I'm pursuing mm-hmm. uh, riches. Yeah. That helps. The second thing is purpose. Like I, I think where you really get into this is if your sole goal in life mm-hmm. is to be wealthy, is to have a certain lifestyle, is to pursue mm-hmm. whoever's going to pay me the most, and I'll go from job to job and do whatever because I'm just chasing money, mm-hmm. you're going to feel lost. I think you're going to feel trapped by yeah. it. I don't think you'll ever reach it. Mm-hmm. That's that line that continues to move. But if you find your purpose in something else, mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that doesn't mean you can't go earn a good living, but it's like it's like business owners. I, I love be getting together with business owners. There's a big difference when you talk to a business owner who's their sole goal is I want to grow my business so that I can. I love I've got five people on my team. I love that I get to provide for them. I want to grow this business. I want to create opportunities for them. Like when you see versus I want to grow this big business and I want to sell it and I want to make, mm-hmm. you know, millions of dollars and then I want to retire and I want to play golf all the time. Mm-hmm. That doesn't sound like much of a purpose to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so motive and purpose, I think really makes a difference. I feel like that frees you up, but if you have the capacity to produce and you don't, I also see things in scripture that would say that's a problem. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like a moral responsibility. If you have the power to generate, um, motive purpose legacy it's interesting um we'll talk about dave ramsey in a minute but um dave ramsey's last two books one was on how to become a millionaire which is really fascinating he talked about how like we in our minds if you're far away from the mark (laughs) like i am then you tend to like almost think of millionaire and billionaires somewhat similar to talk about it's no like he he anyone can become a millionaire yes he argues really could any person no matter how well paying you think your job is if you manage your money right you you should become a millionaire eventually um 
but billionaires is a whole different I would category. say yeah. uh, let's let's at least contextualize that and say more likely here in America. That's what I mean. Yes. I know. I just want to yep. contextualize yep. it just for anybody that hears it. Just yes. want to say it because you have to have an income to do that. And yes. that's, you know. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and then his other book was on legacy. It's called Legacy. Yeah. I don't know if y'all read it, but mm. it's really yeah. interesting. It's fascinating, especially I think as what you're talking about, you'd appreciate it. It's yeah. really kind of an inspiring. But on that note, I'm curious um, not to like hit you against scripture because maybe it's no. just semantics but that whole thing of like don't desire riches mm-hmm. you know we talk about it. it sounds cliche but scripture never says money is the root of evil it says that the love of money sure. is the root of all evil mm-hmm. and you nuance that and then yeah you spend a little bit more time in the second talking about not just um explaining wealth or explaining riches but also um talking about how yeah if god's given you the desire and he's given you the ability to create wealth to do good Mm -hmm. we need more wealthy people doing good yeah we need Um, more rich people doing good works we do um but on that note uh, maybe it would just be an interesting nuance to tease out i've heard people literally say i want to unashamedly become filthy rich so that i can do good so kind of going back to your purpose mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. is that wrong? Like, because I mean, their ultimate purpose is to do good, but their desire is to get rich mm-hmm. so that they can do good. My, my response to that would be number one, I don't think any of us are able to accurately measure someone else's motive. So t- we true. have to go on what someone's telling us. Yeah, right? I'm saying for them. No, I understand. Yeah. What I'm saying is you're, you're saying, what's the response to somebody who says, I want to do that. What I'm saying is I cannot actively measure the motive in that person's heart. That's mm-hmm. the, that's one of the things I said in a message. I said, it, I think more than nine, but I said, this is what's so tricky about this is I'm not talking about money. Mm-hmm. We're talking about motive. Yeah. We're, we're and none of us. It's only God that knows our motive and right. us, you know, our real pure motive. Right. And so somebody can say that what I would if I had the ability and I, where I would not necessarily push back, I would first want to say, why don't you show me the good things you're doing right now? Mm. Because I think anybody that says, no, I want to be filthy rich so that I can do good things. Mm-hmm. I'm going to push back and go, if you're not doing them right now, I don't think you're going to do them when you're filthy rich. True. But, I, but, I've, but I've known people that n- are crazy generous. Okay. But, but want to continue to get crazy what, well. What's wrong with that? I mean, yeah. that's what I'm yeah. saying. Scripture also yeah. says the generous themselves will be refreshed. Mm-hmm. I, the people in my life, through my lifetime, that I have met, and we're not talking about people that came from money, but people that I have watched through their careers mm-hmm. grow and develop and get paid really well and do. Almost every single one of them that I know do really well. They are mm-hmm. the most generous people. Like, we have some friends of ours. They have done very well for themselves Mm -hmm. i mean they make great income for themselves they are the type of they're retired millionaires they did not come from money they earned all themselves paid for themselves go to school all that kind of stuff i i just continue looking and go i I think god blesses them because how generous they are Mm -hmm. they always would have people living in their house Mm -hmm. they would have family members that people that need a place to stay they would literally type of people that if you said hey i need a place come on over however long you need to stay i've I've seen them do that and have people stay Longer than they really even wanted to, but mm-hmm. let open their doors. It's people like that that have a heart of, that are generous. I, I just, I continue to look at scripture and I also think God goes, well, I'm going to bless you. Yeah. It's so funny. I just, I don't think we can cheat God. Yes. In that. Yes. I think we can fool other people. I don't think we can fool God. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I would, yes. and I don't, I think it's, here's what I'd say. I don't think that that is a bad motive. Mm-hmm. If you go, I want to, I want to do so much so that yeah. I can be one of the most generous philanthropist there is yes i don't think that i think that's an amazing motive if you want to go for that do that what what i'm saying is is all the stuff that we're talking about um about how you if you have a love of money it brings all kinds of mess into your life Mm -hmm. there's the destruction causes people to walk away from their faith that's what they're gonna have to wrestle with Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. as long as they don't love money Yep. And they're loving the idea of being generous. But I, again, I would, the only challenge I'd have is I'd look at somebody, if they let me look at it, I'd go, okay, are you being generous now? Because that was one of the questions mm-hmm. that we had. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're answering that question. They were like, the, the guy said, I want to answer that question. And it was a legitimate question. It wasn't somebody filthy rich. It was somebody who was, I think, newer to faith. That's why I loved it. We, it was a great question. They're like, I have all these obligations. I've got mortgage. I've got credit cards. I've got car. I've got student debt. I've got all this. And I, I, they were like, I want to please God. Mm-hmm. I want to put God first. What am I to do? Do I just tithe and say, and drop all that and mm-hmm. say, I can't do with all that? 
again, so that's the whole faith in it. But what I really appreciate about that was there was somebody who was really wrestling the tension going, they even said, I'm new to, I'm new, new to church. Mm-hmm. I, I want to celebrate that person. Yeah. They have the right heart and the yeah. motive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we have a very, I have a very gracious answer for somebody like that, right? Yeah. Um, that's somebody who really wants to write. There's a, but there's a difference of and my answer to that, and we'll, we'll say it on Sunday, so I don't want to give it now, but it's like if you wait until that day for you to start being generous now, I'm just telling you it's never going to happen, and yeah. you don't have your priorities right. Yeah, because yeah, what, what, it's that whole thing of just like power, that old phrase, power corrupts absolutely. Ab- yeah, absolute power, power, power corrupts, corrupts absolutely. absolutely, which is not true. I don't think. I believe that absolute power reveals absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm sure there's some nuance in here, but I'm convinced it's mostly the same with money. You know, more mm-hmm. money is just going to make you more of who you already are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're greedy with money and you get more money, you'll be more greedy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're generous with a little bit of money and you're trusted with more, you'll be more generous. And mm-hmm. we see billionaires on the stage that they are, I'm not going to say greedy, but they're not very generous people. And then mm-hmm. there are some billionaires that are uniquely generous. Yeah. Uh, wait, hold on. I want to pause real quick on the billionaire mm-hmm. conversation because I do think there's people who have a perspective of billionaires well it, okay if you have all this money it'd be easy for you to just to give away large amounts of money to different places and different people um and so i'm not saying this is right or good but i think people will sometimes devalue uh the money that a billionaire will give away to a charity or, or something of that nature um in other words they're not going to be hurting if they give it correct like i would be correct that's what most people would say correct. right yeah correct and, and i guess my question is is like uh, what you know it's two prong. One, what's your reaction to that? And then number two, if you were a billionaire, let's play a hypothetical game. If you were a billionaire and you had, because billionaires could probably give away more money than what they actually give away. Is there a responsibility that you have to to be more generous with your money? I mean, it's hard to tell a billionaire how to spend their money. They've earned it, but like, yeah. it's a hypothetical. I, I think it's a personal thing. Um, I look at people like Bill and Melinda Gates. Yeah, I think it's his wife's name, right? Yeah. Melinda. Mm-hmm. And they have, I mean, we're talking about billionaire, billionaire, like mm-hmm. multiple billionaire. And they made a decision that they were going to give away almost all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are. They do all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. They've really seen their opportunity and what they've received as a, a platform. And op- I mean, like when it comes to philanthropy, they're near the top. Warren, some people would say Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. I think Warren, I don't know all the story about Warren Buffett. I just know, I think Warren Buffett didn't want to give all of the, his riches money to his kids because he thought it would ruin them. Mm-hmm. I've heard that story. I don't know if that's how it goes. Mm. Um, I, I think that's a really personal thing. Here, here's, again, I, I think the whole idea you asked, does it, is it harder or is it, yeah. is it difficult yeah. for yeah. a billionaire? To, I, I think probably in some respects it might be, especially if you're someone who earned it all. You know, just because I think people that have earned it all and that haven't come from a silver spoon where it was just, you know, you, let's just say it's not generational wealth, mm-hmm. but it was somebody that earned it. I think somebody like that, they come from a mindset that any of us would come from, which is, I I earned all this, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah. it's different than generational wealth. Yeah. So I think it's even, I just think it's the whole idea of reveals kind of who you are. I think mm-hmm. you'll, you'll grow and adapt as you become a billionaire, but I think at the end of the day, you're still that person who, yeah. I'm scrapping for everything, you know, yeah. trying to get. And so I think I look at some of them, and I, I can understand that. But I think at the end of the day, the obligation aspect and all of that, I, I think they're I think that's a very personal thing. Yeah. I think if you were going to ask a person who is a faith-oriented person, someone who's a follower of mm-hmm. Jesus, um, I, I think I would want to see that everything that I have, and Scripture says in Deuteronomy 8 that gift is a wealth from God. Mm-hmm. Wealth is a gift from God, sorry. Yeah. That I mean, he told the Israelites, he says that when you go into the land and you're prosperous, mm-hmm. don't ever forget that it's God who gives you mm-hmm. the ability to mm-hmm. earn wealth. And so if I have that, perspective then i am going to feel an obligation to do good with it and that's mm-hmm. why i think passages like we talked about first timothy six are important mm-hmm. because i don't think that there are a lot of, i mean i was telling you this earlier a lot of the context of jesus's time and the people he's speaking to were all were all poor mm-hmm. yeah you know they were oppressed and they were poor Th- then you get the gospel going out and it's reaching the gentiles and it's reaching people who have money and influence beyond the israel you know mm-hmm. it, and and I think there's a reason why Paul had to write to Timothy and say, command those who are rich not to mm-hmm. put their trust in their wealth, but to do good works mm-hmm. and to be generous and to help others in need. So I feel like, and I'll say this, 
I, I don't want to speak like globally because yeah. I think that there's a faith element. I think we can all have our own personal response, but no, as a follower of Christ, when I read scripture, yeah. I would feel a sense of obligation if I'm a billionaire to be massively generous. Yep. Yeah. What That's, you said about the Deuteronomy verse is exactly what I thought of when you talked about, and I think it's a great insight of people that have built wealth with their quote unquote own hands. Yeah. It probably struggles more. I think the question lands differently on whether it's that person or the people looking out. Cause you know, the way you originally phrased it was there's a lot of people that say this. Mm, yeah. So I would echo what he said. Yeah. If you're a follower of Jesus, first off, generosity has, you know, someone once said this generosity is way more about what you keep than what you give. Yeah. It has way more to do with the level of sacrifice it has way more to do with the level of proportionality. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all involved. But my mind, maybe it's because the conversation we had with the he gets his campaign and the unhealthy like relationship with wealth in our nation, my mind immediately goes to people who would throw stones and ask questions about billionaires. Why is that on your heart? Yeah. Like my, my first reaction when you ask that is, that's none of my freaking business what they yeah. do with their money. Mm -hmm. Why would I be so small-minded and have so little going for myself that I want to critique? Because the bottom line is most of the crazy, wealthy, but crazy, generous people – never tell you about their generosity they yeah. don't broadcast yeah. it yeah. you don't know how much they give and you shouldn't know yeah. and it's none of your business and i think it, it kind of goes back to we view people through the lens of what's going on inside of us mm. when yeah, we're good. when we're not generous we assume the least charitable assumptions not of everybody right. else yeah, they good. must not be generous they must be stingy they must be this and i just think it just yeah it's none of your business <laughs> what yeah. they do with it yeah. why would that bother you yeah, no, that's a good question, I think. And the truth is, none of us really know what we would do. Yeah. It is a really yeah. lazy and accurate thing yeah. I, for me to say, well, if I was a billionaire, well, maybe if I handle my money better, God will trust me to be a billionaire and I can find out. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, no, I, it's I good. love your point. <laughs> no, no, it's good because I think, um, again, just to preface, I think there's a lot of people, especially, I'm going to point the finger at millennials mm -hmm. and Gen Z, perhaps, maybe more, who maybe think through this lens mm -hmm. uh, that, and I that seems very socialist lens to think through well I, let's be honest this is almost political it's like the difference yeah. of capitalism or someone who free opportunity to create something versus wait this isn't fair it's inequitable distribution of wealth they've got all the money and mm -hmm. i don't and how easy is it to dehumanize people i think we dehumanize wealthy people about their money the way we dehumanize famous people about their character yeah yeah we think it's okay to take shots at somebody because they're famous. Yeah. We think it's okay to take shots at somebody because they're wealthy and make them less than human and just put them on a table to say, well, here's what you should do, shouldn't do. Yeah. That's, but I think that's a great I, point, I think, too. I think one of the reasons why some people, I'm going to say this, why some people, I think one of the primary reasons, I know I want to take out the whole um, opportunity and, okay, you have different opportunities than I had and I understand that there's some s social situations where that's inequitable so I just want to remove that for a moment from the conversation I think we get jealous mm -hmm. that's good. I think that's one of the reasons why we sit there and go why don't they give away money and blah 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 and I, you know we get jealous of what of their of their success and I want to talk about not generational wealth where people are born into it. I want to talk about people who've earned it yeah mm -hmm. um, I think one of the primary things that I see over and over in people who are really successful and do well is I see most of them are not afraid to take risks. And I think a lot of other people live very safely. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about purely when it comes to money and business. You, you would be hard pressed to find any million, multimillionaire or billionaire that Who has take not risk. taken massive risks. Yes. Yeah. And the reason why, what separates people, and, and you'd be surprised how many multimillionaires and or billionaires have lost a more money than any of us could ever imagine yeah. and have had to rebuild and do it. Mm -hmm. And when I hear their stories, and, I, and I'm always fascinated by it, and hear yeah. people talking about it and the mindset that they have and the way they do it, I am constantly challenged. One of my favorite, I'm recommending this at a, at a, a business leader small group that I'm doing as just a fun read to them talking about risk. And um, one of my just favorite enjoyable biographies, I think it was a biography to read, was Shoe Dog mm -hmm. by Phil Knight. And it might have been so auto. Good. Did he write it himself? Maybe yes. did. Okay, so it was autobiography because it yep. was by Phil Knight. Phil Knight, yep. And so when good. I read that, I was, I wasn't like, I was challenged as a faith leader mm -hmm. of a church. Mm -hmm. This was years ago already. To go, here is somebody who 
over and over risked everything to live in his car, to all this other stuff, like on the edge of bankruptcy, all this, that built this massive empire. And none of it would have been possible if he hadn't taken the risk that he had taken. Yep. Yeah. And I wonder how many of us, can I just speak to even pastors and people in a faith context who should have all the reason in the world to have massive faith because mm -hmm. of the one we believe and we trust and, you know, mm -hmm. said, I'll build my church will be afraid to take any kind of risk whatsoever. I love it. Because yeah. we could fail. And and so uh, then our self-esteem tanks and it's easier just to feel jealous because we don't think we can do it. Yeah. And when you said the jealousy thing, it reminded me, you know, you make fun of me for all my quotes. It reminded me George Bernard Shaw said that self-righteousness is usually just jealousy with a halo. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder uh, how often that's, that's a, I wonder how true that is not just uh, in church circles. Yeah. How like we, we critique a mega church yeah we critique this leader and we have really religious reasons why and yeah. i wonder how much of it is self-righteousness with the halo yeah mm. that's, that's good i love that quote that's good especially in, in this in this conversation and talking mm -hmm. about you know what should billionaires do i agree with you we shouldn't worry about what billionaires <laughs> should do we should worry about what we, we can do what mm -hmm. we can do and, and that's the thing you know there is i i try to i try to sometimes remember this but i I think about the impact the church could have if people who f claim to follow Jesus would prioritize giving God the first fruits, even mm -hmm. even something, even if it's tithe or this. I, I, I mean, if every follower of Jesus really did believe in that, in the tithe and did it, I mean, no church would have debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, we could eradicate poverty as a mm -hmm. church globally, worldwide. It, it, the things that, that a church or any church could do would be unimaginable. And you don't need billionaires to do that. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. like we think billionaires are the ones that make the world go round. Whoa. No, it's the billions that make the world go round of people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you know, and so we think sometimes, what do I have to do? How much can I make a difference? Well, when there's thousands of people and they give you a tie, you could, that gets worth millions. What was it? It was staggered by the stat you gave one time at some event that like, if even, I don't know, if everybody gave a tithe, here's what could happen yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Th those stats are out there. It's I mean, especially crazy. globally, like in poverty, in world hunger, like 10 times over. Like, yeah. There's so many things it could do. It would fund. I mean, it changed the world. It's crazy. Generosity does change the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an incredible motive. In fact, one of the guys that is going to be speaking this weekend, um, I don't want to steal what he said about his purpose, but it was connected to generosity and how much he can give. Mm. Mm. And I, I think that is a beautiful purpose. Mm -hmm. And if that really is your purpose, and I hear people like that, you know what I think to myself? I hope God blesses that person with a ton of yeah. opportunity and a ton yeah. of money. Well, you told me about a conversation you had. I won't go in detail. That reminded me of a conversation I had a few weeks ago with some of my friends. Um, it also reminded me of a conversation that I had. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you don't even know what it is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I had lots of conversations. Um, but this one, this guy told me, um, I mean, just – He's like, he, he looks too cool, and it just makes me mad because he just looks so cool and has the coolest family and is brilliant, a deep follower of Jesus, but also just like this insane entrepreneurial mind and just a deep well, selfless, generous. And he, he just, in passing, was like, man, I just literally, he goes, I remember like 10 years ago, another random quote, and G.K. Chesterton used to say, um, sometimes the only problem with being rich is you have to be dull enough to want it. Mm. <laughs> and it just reminded me of that. Cause this guy said, he goes, you know, 10 years ago, I remember when I actually cared about money. He goes, now, man, I just want to make money so I can change the world. Yeah. He goes, you know, my dream is just to be able to slip across a check and pay off the building. Yep. And I'm like, like you I said, did. I talked to, like, talk to a guy who was like, that would be my dream. And I said, I want that dream for you. <laughs> yeah. Like, man, like to free us up to, I don't know. Okay. So, um, I think what you said was great. I think there's a lot of gold in there, especially as someone who, you know, is connected to Gen Z and uh, spends time talking and have, having conversations with them there. I'm curious, I'm done to put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, give me like two Russ life hacks or spiritual hacks for if you want to grow in your generosity <laughs> this week. What's two practical things someone can do this week to grow your generosity? Uh, well, I don't know if this is too holistic, but if you don't have time to go to a Dave Ramsey class, just think 10, 10, 80 as a good place to start for life that will set you up for life. Or 10, 20, 80. What is it? Or 10, 20, 80. <laughs> 10, 20, 70. 
Uh, the good. There's I know what you're saying, yeah, but yeah. there's another model that I've also pitched before. It's 10 20 70. Yeah. So to keep it simple, 10 10 80, because you'll probably remember that more than you will yeah. 10 15 19 24 no, 7 10, 70. The is, 20 was it, from <laughs> scripture. It was the story of Joseph. Yeah. So that's where it was. Okay. Well, he'll ask <laughs> fight, you that. Fight, fight, fight. <laughs> so, I don't trust Dave Ramsey when it comes to scripture. So this wasn't Dave Ramsey. Oh. Um, uh, this thing was Randy Alcorn. 10 10 80. Uh, first ten percent pay God, second ten percent pay you. Live off the rest. Yeah. So, your first fruits go to God. They belong to Him. If you're yeah. a follower of Jesus, that's not an option. They, yep. they belong to Him. Uh, it's not. I mean, technically, if you want to get theological, it's not even giving. <laughs> they just belong to Him. Yeah. <laughs> it's when you go into offerings that you're actually giving. Um. So sometimes our language actually betrays us. Anyways, your second ten percent, you pay you. Yep. It goes into savings. Yep. And then you live off the rest. So that would be. I don't know if there's a life hack. But that's the first thing that popped to yeah. my mind. Is that. Yeah. Um, and then I don't, I'm not one, I'm not Mr. Finance. I, I'm, you know, Dave Ramsey says that when it comes to your finances, it's uh 20% knowledge, 80% behavior. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like my behavior, it, uh, doesn't, uh, match up to my knowledge, <laughs> if I'm being honest yeah. in this area. Um, so I just want to be transparent. Um, I could do way better in budget. I'm pretty conservative when it comes to any kind of debt. Mm-hmm. And I'm grateful someone taught me the tithe. You're liberal when it comes to spending. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I, li- I like to say it this way. I'm joking. I'll, I'll, well, not, no, it's true. Not. It's true. I, I'm pretty conservative when it comes to debt. And, you know, I, I was grateful to have somebody teach me the tithe 20 something years yeah. ago. Um, so I like to say it this way I'm pretty liberal when it comes to giving and spending. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how that how how works out. Yeah. There you go. Y- you know, um, mm. but yeah, life hack 10, I, 10, 80. And then I, I would just say, I think this is maybe this is the opposite of a hack. I think too few people sit down and actually create vision for their finances. Mm. I, I, I think too few, let's back up, too few people create vision for their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for their spiritual lives, their mm-hmm. families. But I, I actually met with a guy um, a couple of weeks ago. We had lunch, and there's, there's some stress, some financial strain that's dipping into marital strain. And my mind went to uh, a marriage book, actually, by um, by Lisa and Francis Chan called The Story of Marriage. And I had a friend that I forgot I gave it to him, like, years ago. And five years later, he was like, do you remember giving me that book? And I'm like, no, honestly, I don't. He's like, that, mar- that book changed our marriage. Mm. Because that book really goes into, more than I've ever seen any marriage book go into, the idea of writing vision together as a couple over your home, over your family, over your finances. And I think too few people have vision. I think one of the reasons, even though most of us know what to do with money, we don't still do it is because you don't ultimately go in the direction of obligation. You go in the direction of vision and desire. Mm -hmm. And I think too few people actually sit down and say, what vision do I have? If you're a single person, if you're a married (laughs) person, yeah. Um, so I don't know if that answers at all. It does. Do you have any? Yeah, I could give you some actual tips. <laughs> yeah, give me some. So that was just some life advice. He <laughs> didn't give you any actual tips. Give me like life hacks. Tips to become generous to, to, yeah, to right now to, to start gr- doing yeah. it. Uh, I can give you some real practical ones. Um, I think we do not ever think of this, but you should you should start saving to be generous. Mm, I think good. most of the time we're trying to be generous out of margin that we don't have. And we don't have margin because most of us don't live with margin. So I think the first thing I would do is I would start today and create a savings account for generosity. So that could be as simple as, and and I'm a, I have a lot of weird, um, uh, I want to say weird views when it comes to saving. Like I, I, I believe I have multiple accounts. I have like five, six, I don't know how many different places. I'm not even sure where they are anymore. Um, which is not true, but I, I, I have multiple different automatic withdrawals out of my account every pay time. Every time I get paid, I have emergency fund money that goes. I have a general savings one that goes over there that we use for general things. We use for vacation stuff. We have. A, I've been saving for because I have a wedding right now. So mm-hmm. I have one that goes to wedding. I have one that goes to uh, that had gone to, towards some college that we've tried to save over the years. Not a lot. It hasn't been a lot, but the. I have one that goes toward a dental fund. I have one. So I, I believe very much in saving for a purpose. And the reason why a lot of people hate saving money is because we grew up being told you have to save your money as kids. I actually think it's a detriment to our kids 
when we force them to stick money in a, a piggy bank and we just tell them because you have to save it. Now, I understand the practice in itself can be good. This is one of the things I, I said, and I might come out on Sunday. I think a better practice is, and I think it's good to teach your kids about saving. I'm not saying that. I think you teach your kids about saving for a purpose. Mm -hmm. That changes the things. Then you actually want to. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, to me, I would do that so that when my kid is 12 years old and they're going, I want a new Xbox or I want a new this, you go, okay, well, are you saving for it? Do you have you saved for it? Or you forced them to save money when they were little and hey, okay, let's put half of it aside, half here, or whatever things you did. You say, go get your piggy bank out. And, uh, I'm going to pause real quick. Yeah. In, in the practical life advice, mm -hmm. if you're a parent trying to teach your kids generosity, mm -hmm. would you give them allowance to give them a I don't steady give allowance. source of, nope. you, you don't do it? Nope. I didn't, give, I didn't get an allowance. I don't give an allowance. Why? We, because my parents gave us an opportunity to earn money. Mm. Why would you just get free money? Well, well who's going to do that in life? What are you teaching most, your kids? Most what are you people, teaching your kids? Most, you go, hey, you breathe. Here's $10 a most week. Most people would connect allowance to some sort of like household okay, duty well, don't, or chore. Well, don't, don't call it an allowance. That's Income. my parents didn't. What they did for us was they had we had a board you're so, on ten today i'm serious <laughs> that they did for us we had a we had a board and we would have all these different household chores that we could do uh -huh. you were responsible mm -hmm. for your room if you wanted to va back then you wanted to vacuum two dollars you wanted to clean the kitchen three dollars you wanted to mop there's a you could make 20 to 25 dollars a week if you wanted to mm. if you want to do work you don't want to do work you're not getting money I think it's a terrible thing to teach your kids that you're alive and you're breathing, so here's 20 bucks a week. Mm -hmm. I'd never do that. Mm -hmm. I told my kids, even when they were younger and they want money, I'm like, well, you can earn it. Mm -hmm. There's a job. I remember at one point, I think it was Audrey. I don't know it was Lord. I can't remember. I, I literally, at one point, they wanted money. Oh, we don't want money. We don't have any money. Said, All mm -hmm. right, well, I'll give you an opportunity to earn money. So I wrote up a contract. Mm -hmm. So there's your job contract. Again, when they're younger, you do it. Make your bed every day. Mm -hmm. You make your bed every day. It's a dollar, whatever you get five dollars at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to teach my kids a proper management and understanding of money. So when they earn that money, then I'm going to talk to them about, OK, now here's what we do. Mm -hmm. We give to God first. Why? Yeah. I'm going to explain that to them. It's Second good. thing is you should save. It's good. Why do you want to save? Because there's going to be some things that you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, not, I think that's the problem. We don't give kids a reason to save for something. So then they get older, mm -hmm. and then it's like life comes, and you, they hear a preacher go, you ought to save. Like, I hate saving money. All right, yeah. Zach, now I'm going to give you some actual tips. Well, hold on. Um, I didn't get to uh, the real tips. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, give me, give me, so, okay give me real quick tips that you can do. Uh, one of the things that, um, again, you can use it for different purposes. Uh, set up an Acorns account. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Let them take off. So we we do Percentages. we do we don't do it necessarily for giving. Mm -hmm. Well, we do for giving actually. We do it for helping to give gifts to people at Christmas time. That's mm -hmm. what we've typically done. It's just a small little something on the side that we won't miss. Mm -hmm. So they do the roundup. They draw that out every week. We also said here's five dollars every week. That's it. It's not a lot. Something that look it. You go get a pizza. You're going to spend more than you did on this or whatever. So it wasn't a lot. By the time we get to the end of the year, it's usually worth somewhere around nine hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at it. I don't get in and check it every day. I don't even check it. We'll literally come up around Christmas time. We'll go, oh, how much is an Acorns account? Because we got my Christmas stuff. Oh, $900. Mm -hmm. Well, we're buying all this. Let's transfer it over to our checking so we can pay. Yeah, and sir, for everybody listening that doesn't know what Acorns is, because I agree, I use it. It's awesome. Yeah. It's simply something that connects to your debit, your checking account, and it rounds up yep. every purchase. Yep. So you don't think about it. You don't see it. And it is crazy how quickly it adds it's up. It's a small amount. So what I'm just saying is, I guess the 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 – the, the life hacks I would give is save to be generous because it makes a huge difference. If you just create an account and you put 10 bucks in it every week or every other week or when you got paid and you go, I can't be very generous right now. Just wait a half year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, wait a year and all of a sudden you're going to end up if you know, you're going to go, I got $400 in this account. Here's an opportunity. You don't touch it. It's designated for mm -hmm. being generous. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's a, that's beyond what I would do for the tithe or this. I would, I would do that. I think that there's other things about being generous. I think you could, something I, I would try to do, I don't have it on me, is I would always try to keep like a $20 bill on me in my wallet. I don't do a whole lot of cash. I know you guys don't, probably you don't, and, that, and I almost never spend it. Mm -hmm. Like even if I go to the store and something's $12, I use my debit mm -hmm. card or whatever, I try never to spend it. I always, I always wanted to have cash just in case there was ever, you know, our kids, my kids would say, oh, I need money, they gotta have this school, I'll be ready. But also, I always love the opportunity that if I see somebody in need that I have a $20 bill or I have something mm -hmm. in my wallet that I'm not thinking about, it's not watching my account, it's money that I pull aside that at any time I see somebody I could give. Yeah.
And you don't have to, it don't have to be a mm -hmm. lot. You could just be, you were going to give your tip to your waiter or waitress and you hear mm -hmm. they're, they're really going through something or struggling and you can put a regular t uh, tip on the bill on mm -hmm. your credit card or your debit card and then you can pull that $20 bill out and stick it on top of it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, no, that's great. I, one thing, because you're talking, when you talk about saving, I love that idea, saving to be generous. That's, you know, by definition, you're saving for future generosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just, to me, triggers a life hack for your regular generosity would be to generate um, automatic, to use automatic, mm -hmm. um, uh, what do we call it? Automatic giving. Yeah, yeah. schedule so, your giving. So, so, so if, you know, if, you're in the church, yeah, if you're in the church world, like, and it's like a struggle, you're like, oh, to get in the habit or to <laughs> remember, um, I'm an old soul. I've been doing it so long that I like the... <laughs> It sounds cheap, corny, but for me, it's like an act of worship. Mm -hmm. I like the act of the morning that I know I get paid going online and yep. doing it. But um, I'm weird. For most people, I mean, I'm assuming most people, again, I'm a, making assumption you're in the faith world. But if you're in the faith world and you give, um, I'm assuming you use automatic uh, bills to pay electric, yeah. yep. rent, whatever. What more important than, you know to fund what God's doing in the world and lives being changed, the world being changed. Um, so I think that'd be another thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. What about you? Well, those are all really good. I, I think one thing that this is something that we have told young couples who've come through and um, done premarital counseling with us. And it's something we try to do it. And listen, we're not perfect at this, um, but it kind of goes back to the communication vision piece. But, but I think, um, involving um both husband wife partners and spouses in the conversation mm -hmm. around money i think helps and i think um i think for us i resonate with the vision piece so we'll get together once a week and we'll have like a finance meeting where it's mm -hmm. like okay what are we what are we spending our money on what are we how are we planning out our budget and i think it's doing this so that we are trying to create the margin yeah. so we can do it. So I think that would be the next, <laughs> that what you're talking about, the saving for generosity, Budget. that's the next step for us. But we're, but we're even being intentional in terms of like, okay, what are just the good money habits mm -hmm. that would create the margin in yeah. the space for it? So I don't know if I have like, yeah. you guys yeah. are, are much better in terms of that. Oh, I don't know. One thing on in terms of vision though, yeah. you know, another thought too is if you're a goal person, yeah. a lot of us have like these financial goals of what do we want to make. Yeah. But another powerful concept is yeah. giving goals. You know, I, I've talked, yep. it's funny, what was it Francis Chan talked about forever ago? He set this goal of, and this before he wrote his first book. He's yeah. like, I want, we want to give a million dollars this year. And it, they, they felt like that was a God thing that they felt prompted. We want to give, but he's like, how in the, we don't make a million dollars. How yeah. are we going to do that? Yeah. And then um, Crazy Love yeah. came out, became this crazy mm -hmm. iconic hit, and he made a million dollars. And it's like okay, and every year they decided to up their giving goals, and it was crazy. It was kind of it's kind of the opposite of what most people do. And from their giving goals, the money came, and would flow. And I was just always inspired by that. Let's go. Cool. The, the one Our other, goal was ten million this year. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I knew that was coming. The, the one other, the one other, I guess practical. Piece. Can I steal someone else's goal and put <laughs> yeah, it in you there? Can. You can't let the let the the generosity of God flow, flow. from my goal. <laughs> flow from that oh, I, I know i'm the, with it the one yeah. other, the one other practical piece i would say and, and then i think this is just because i'm coming i feel like my wife and i were kind of coming out of that young season of our life mm -hmm. and um it, it wasn't too long ago that we were the like okay what how are we gonna pay for groceries this week like what are we gonna do and mm -hmm. figuring all that out but i think if you find yourself like I don't know if I have that margin. I don't know if I have that capacity. I don't maybe earn a ton to have the extra 20 to carry around. I think you talk about keystone habits. Mm -hmm. Like you can cultivate a spirit of generosity um, without actually giving money. And a, a way that I would say, like, so if you're a young person and you're single and, okay, how do I, if someone needs help, I'm going to volunteer my time to go and help them um, generously. And like be able to like to give of yourself in that way. Uh, I think that can be a way to start to cultivate just a sense of giving um, and, and helping people out. Um, I think that's a way I would encourage someone to, I to sense, grow that. I sense pushback with you. I, I, it's not generosity in terms of money. I don't, yeah, it's not generosity um, in, in that term. It, as in the term we're doing. I, I think it's still great. I think no. it's still <laughs> great practice. I just, I just. Cut that from the podcast. Yeah. Well, 
<laughs> Matt, get rid of it. What? <laughs> it's fine. I can take it. No, I. <laughs> My favorite moment. <laughs> what? Of podcast history. What? That great little pat on back. No, no, no. It's great. No, it's, it's good. No, I. Hey, good, good try. <laughs> I'm just I, I think I, of people. No, well, okay. Here's what I would say to that. If it's I'm not just, time to treasure talent, can I say? Can I, say can I? I want to speak to it. Um, I had somebody that's young, um, who is, um, brand new in his faith that came up and said that very thing to me mm. this past Sunday. This is gonna be good. And he, he is. This is somebody who really does like want to be generous i mean we're talking really coming to faith and it is awesome we're seeing it um and he was like i just i don't have a whole lot of money Mm -hmm. right now i I can't remember the whole scenario so i don't know if he was like you know i've got some debts or this and that i don't even think that but he was like i just don't have a lot of money right now to be generous but i always try to be generous um with my time and i'm trying to serve and help people and i said that's awesome i really did i said that's i love the fact that you're doing that and it was Really, this was coming from a sincere place. The reason why I would give some pushback is I think a lot of people value their money, especially younger people. They value money more than they value their time, so they're willing to give their time, but they won't give their money. I I just push back on it here and there when I can because I have heard that excuse over and over and over again, and usually it is speaking to someone who's mismanaging their money and saying, I don't have the money to give. You, you can you can be making minimum wage and give something. I'm not saying that that's there so only I can give a tithe or this or because of whatever then they don't maybe trust that. And so I, I just looked at him I said, I love the fact that you are giving of your time. I said, if I could just encourage you and challenge you because he actually wants to give financially like he, he was like, mm-hmm. I'm hoping to do this this and I want to be able to give financially. I said that's awesome. can I encourage you don't I know the tithe may seem like a str- a lot and I get it. If you're brand new to faith and you've come in and you've over obligated your yourself, you know, when it comes to your finances and there's no margin and you hear something like that and you have a true like you're in a true authentic place. You're going to be in a real con- conflicted place. Mm-hmm. And I have a ton of grace for people in that situation. And I think I told myself, here's what I would encourage you to do, because I really do believe God will honor you if you take a step of faith. Mm-hmm. And I don't give this advice necessarily all the time and broadcast it, whatever. But I said, look, I. I would pick, even if it's a small percent, I would pick something that maybe feels like a challenge or a stretch to you, and I would just test God, as Scripture invites us to do with the tithe. I said I would test God with it. I would do something like that and just be consistent. And I said, watch as you manage your money and you, you see what God will do in there, you're going to see that you actually were able to do it. Uh, yeah. And so I, so it's not that I don't appreciate the idea of giving up time. I think that's, I just think that's an excuse more than it, it, it's a valid reason. Yeah. So again, yeah. If you have somebody who doesn't have any money, mm-hmm. you have zero income. Mm-hmm. You have no way to do that. I think the idea of being generous with your time is huge. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just, be, I'm just real cautious because I think most of the time it's an excuse for people who've mismanaged their money. Perhaps I should have prefaced and led with the fact that. In these cases, I was assuming that they were at least giving something. Uh, yeah, I, that's on, what I meant. I'm just on saying, top of. I just meant uh, I wouldn't. But they don't get, feel I like they have just, a ton yeah. of extra. I mean, I mean even if you to get, give financially, even again, a lot of assumption here is to follow Jesus. But even if you go past what Scripture teaches about a tithe and what belongs to God, even if you go past that and you really just go back to Jesus talking about this is a heart issue, that our hearts connected to it. You know, I jokingly mentioned there's that cliche. But it's true of time, treasure, talent. The generosity is made of those three things. You're you're giving your time, you're giving your treasure, resource, money, whatever, and your talent, your giftings. And you know, if you bring this down to any area of life, you see that there is a reflex reaction of love in those three areas. Guy falls in love with a girl. I mean, if he's head over heels, no one has to twist his arm to apply all three, because generosity is the reflex of love. And so when someone falls in love, the guy falls in love with the girl, he's going to be get, he's going to be spending all the time he can. He's going to spend every spare cent that isn't going to gas, going to be buying d- dead flowers um, and trying to spoil her with gifts. And whatever talent he's got, if, he's, if he can sing, he's going to find a way to sing to her. If he can, whatever. I, and I, I just think sometimes we forget that 
everything we talk about in the context of faith is at its core relational. And that, you know, for me at least, I have to go back to my story. When I fell in love with Jesus, like, no one had to twist my arm. Mm -hmm. It was, oh, I fell in love. Everything I got is going to be a reflex of generosity towards the love that was shown to me. Now, you speak to the practical. That is different than fast forward 20 years, a guy's got, you know, a family and kids and he's strapped financially, wants to, mm -hmm. but he's like, oh my gosh, where I start. <laughs> that is where um, <laughs> love becomes fleshed out in trust. <laughs> How much do I really trust that God can take my 90% and mm -hmm. send it further? And that's where the three of us around this table could tell story after story. Yes. And, yeah. but, it, but it's tough when you're first starting out. There's that, yeah. there's the, you know, there is a reason that our wallet is usually the last thing we surrender to God because that takes a lot of trust. But I also think there is the practical. It's interesting. We talk a lot about um, Robert Morris. He has incredible books on generosity, the blessed life, yep. changed a lot of people's lives. But then, you know, a decade later, he comes out with a sequel called Beyond Blessed that really deals more with stewardship. And he said, what I found in all my years traveling is that the, the, there's two legs to being blessed by God financially. There's generosity and there's stewardship. He said, I never wrote this book because I just always thought it was assumed. Yeah, wasn't well, it kind of <laughs> almost as prequel, even though it was done afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, Didn't he yeah. say it should have yeah. been? Yeah, because he's like, I assume that people knew <laughs> that part of being able to be generous was is true. stewarding your money well. Yeah. And so the two go hand in hand. Um, and I think all of us probably, if we're honest, intrinsically struggle with one more than the other. Mm -hmm. For me, I'll just be straight up. Like the generosity part's not that hard. Yeah. The stewardship, stewardship part <laughs> yeah. of living by budget. Yeah. That's like that's yeah. you know, that's that's I'm not as strong as the yeah. generosity part. And I just think we have to be honest and say, okay, which one of those areas which one of the legs is weak? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do I strengthen the knees in that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if and if I need to strengthen the knees of generosity, if I'm just gonna get real philosophical with it, I think you straighten you, you strengthen the knees of generosity by strengthening the back of gratitude. You cannot, as Deuteronomy, mm. can daily <laughs> take a gratitude walk or remind yourself that everything you have is from God and realize that the breath in your lungs, the strength in your hands, the roof over your head, the food on your plate, the relationships in your life, yeah. that's gonna help release your hands yeah. to be generous. Yeah. And then when it comes to stewardship, I, I, I think that's for me where vision, accountability, um, for some for some people it's knowledge. That's why we offer courses for free. Yeah. So, some, some of us have just never been shown how to steward well. Mm. And so it's an education experience. Yep. I think the one thing that was most interesting that I wanted to at least <laughs> maybe touch on before we wrap up was one of the things we were talking about of having this conversation was the article that you sent us. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. Should we pivot hard to that? We, we I don't can. think it's a pivot. I think it's part of the whole conversation. It was just the idea. We've been talking about Dave Ramsey yep. yeah. a bit. And Dave Ramsey has a very, very conservative view of managing your money. Yep. Right? I mean, is that a good word to use? Conservative? Yes. Like his, his model is you get out of debt at all costs. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. And avoid you never debt like the plague. Avoid debt like the plague, all this stuff that, you know, you then worry about saving for really saving for the future and all that stuff and um his kind of mantra is almost like what is it um eat rice and beans or something like that right yes. you, you don't ever go out to eat you don't ever do anything you live as broke as you can be live like nobody else so that you can live live like, like nobody, nobody else, else right later. that's later. later later and and the article which we weren't able to read but you had sent was how there is big pushback People 40 and younger. Yes. Against him. Push back against that. And what he's, he's, they're pushing back against, we don't want to wait until we're out of debt to live a certain way. They feel like he lacks social context in terms of understanding that most young people are saddled with 25, 50, 70,000 plus dollars of See, student loan debt. I don't think he is. I don't think he does not understand that social context. I I listen to his show. He has people every single day who call. Like I think he's quite aware of it. He would say, "Don't go into that." Yeah, that. I agree with him. Uh, <laughs> in order to get your <laughs> education, <laughs> I, what, why are you coming to me? I'm, I'm not. Like, I'm just <laughs> responding to you. No, I just, agree with you him. Have I kind of play I have the a, I have representative a, of this. Yes, stamp. that's yes, why I, have. Yes, I, have. I I that's that's a whole other podcast. I just. <laughs> 
I don't think you have to go into debt to go to college. Mm. You probably don't. I don't think you have to. I think we have a mindset, a lot of people in our culture, that they're, well, I want to go to college. Well, then I need to finance the whole thing. And I'm going to do this experience. I don't think you do. I didn't have anybody financing my college going, and we made barely any money married on our own. Literally, I told that story this last week. I mean, I was making $7.50 an hour. We're married. She's making $24 a week cleaning some lady's house for three hours a Friday. Like, we didn't have hardly any money, but, you know. But, I mean, you're, but you're being very black and white. I mean, what? what? I'm sorry. Uh, I, you either are <laughs> no, going no, no, dead no. or you're not. Like, I'm just saying. No, I'm just. Oh, there what, is what, a way the, to do it. What about the person who's spending. <laughs> what? what? $3,000 a year <laughs> on, on, their, on their education. You know. What? 3000 Yeah. We did. That's not that much. They're going into debt $5,000 a year for their education. Like. What about it? Is that bad? Should they not do that? I would. I would, would say not to. I would choose not to if I were you. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that well, you can't. I've already paid lots I, I, of money listen, for my it, education. I, I, yeah. I, <laughs> I think there's, there's some a, personal think, pain involved. In I this think one. there's a whole lot of scenarios. So I don't – here's the one thing I think I can kind of empathize with the comment of, or the, the position of the people in that article. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's necessarily – Can I say for the people that this was not my position? Yeah, I know. I, 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 I know just, you were right. But, but I was, kind of. But kind of, but yes. I, I said that I kind I, of agree with – Okay, okay. I, I, under, like, I understand the way – because you didn't, we didn't get to the other part. The way he presents stuff and the way it's he, harsh. the way he comes across, is very harsh but, in his approach. But I think he does that on purpose. I, I agree. I with think you. he does I on agree purpose because everybody's been coddled so much that if someone goes, "Well, I think maybe you shouldn't," or not, he's going to go, "No, you're stupid." Okay, here's the problem though. And he says it like here's that. Here's the problem though. You're stupid. And he's, here's, here's, here's your pro- southern grumpy grandpa giving the problem, folks though. advice. <clears throat> and I, I've told you this. You're before. saying it doesn't motivate people to hear that. Yes. Like any coach, any good – okay, I'm, I'm a football player, so I'm going to relate back to coaching. Any good coach is going to come alongside a player and understand how to motivate them and how to speak to them and coach them in a way that they receive the feedback and, and apply it to whatever craft they're doing. So if you're a communicator and you have an important life principle that you're trying to communicate to an audience, mm. how do you come alongside – Okay. That audience and communicate it to them in a way that. Here's where I disagree with I that. I don't know that I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't. I, I actually. Money is an emotional thing. Yes. And I think there's a reason why he has to be that way because most people will not hear it. Yeah. People only respond to motivation. Now, obviously, there's some people that don't receive from him. I think if you were to ask him what he's doing, I, I think when you. I think most of the lessons he's extremely motivating and encouraged. Like, you could do this. Go. Free yourself from the gazelle. He's literally screams yes. and and runs on stage like he's a football coach. Yes. But I do think he believes, I think is what I he'd say, that. that there is so many lies about how to handle money that have been accepted in our society. The delusion is so thick. The lies have been so repeated. The deception is so ingrained that he has to come with a sledgehammer to destroy it and wake people up. Yeah. I definitely agree with you. And some people get their feelings hurt. Is that they, what you're saying? They do. I, they do. Well, yes. I, I, I actually – here's the thing. I've never been a huge um, – I've, I've gone through Dave Ramsey's stuff. I thankfully have not in the way that he has, but generally have applied those principles. I credit a lot of that to – my parents were really amazing examples of it. Never mm. lived in debt. Didn't make a lot of money. But, I mean, even like – they've told stories. And, I, again, I've never forgotten as You know, my mom came from – money kind of like i was talking about on sunday my mom came from you know people that had wealth my dad did not they were poor poor and um and so i think the value of money is interesting when you grow up in a different you know environments and context and so they get married my mom's like 19 dad right they're about the same age they brand new get married and they end up they getting a place to stay and my mom says okay we need to get furniture and my dad goes, yes, we do. He says, we have $800 to furnish their whole house. Wow. This was a long while ago, but it was still wasn't very much money. It was something mm-hmm. like that, $800 or something like that. And she was like, what do you mean, $800? He's like, we have $800. Gosh, we, we need to get a couch. We need to get a table. We need to get this. We need that. We have $800. She's like, we, we can just we have a credit card. We can just go. He's like, we're not buying anything on credit. And again, the way he grew up and lived, there was no that. And so they made a decision early on in their marriage. They were like, and my dad won that conversation. And my mom's <laughs> grateful that he did. And he says, no, this is how much money we have. We have this. We're going to use this. This is what we're going to spend. 
And so that really set them on a course where they just never went in the day. I mean, they still to this day, I mean, they, every car I've ever known that they've ever owned, they pay cash for. That's so antithetical to the way people think about money. Today. I understand it is. <laughs> I, I, but let's look at how the world is right now when it comes to money. Oh, they're the drowning in debt and they're miserable. Credit card debt is higher and, than what's and, ever been in and, America. And so I don't, I, it might be antithetical, but it's the whole or live like no one today mm -hmm. so you can live like no one tomorrow. It like for real. Like it's like yeah. we, we sit there and we kind of go poo poo that because I don't get to go enjoy life the way I want to enjoy life right now. But are you really enjoying life? Like it, there's no yeah. vision. There's no. I mean, not to sound old fashioned, but it is that kind of whole thing of like be weird. Yeah. Like if you want to live, I mean, it, it, it is weird to not go in debt. So be weird. It's weird to wait till marriage and keep yourself be we no. it's, 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 it's almost like that thing in every area of life to live well is to be weird mm -hmm. and, and and to be fair i just want to say we don't we don't ever have no debt we we have a lot of times we'll have a car payment so this was an interesting dynamic for us because we had no car payments we had old cars when we were mm -hmm. married um i always had that picture in front of me of you pay cash for a car and um yeah that was an example they said in the article i forgot to mention that was car like people yeah I, i'll be honest with you we have not paid cash for a car ever yeah in our now we never usually carry more than one car payment at a time we buy a car that is used we because and not because i have anything against new cars i'm too cheap the 20 percent depreciation driving off a lot i'm gonna let somebody else take that depreciation so we've always bought one two three year old cars almost always um, and we'll buy one car and we'll keep it for 10 years. People think they're crazy. My wife's car is 217,000 miles on it and it is over 10 years old. It's 14 or, uh, sorry, it's 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, people think we're crazy. My last car I had was over 10 years old. We will buy it and drive it forever and fix it however it needs fixed. And, but I remember, you know, what I, that model was in front of us was like, you don't, you know, don't go pay into don't go into debt and we and, for thing. and i'm thankful for it we over the years from the most part we've never gone into debt credit card debt we don't have student debt the only debt we've ever really had is one car that's all we've ever had um and there's some seasons we have none and um but we're 20 and 18 we're married i say 21 and 19 that year my parents leave the country her parents leave the country literally the next year i mean we're 21 19 years old living on our own making twenty thousand dollars a year you know and when my dad left the country my free auto mechanic left the country <laughs> <laughs> my dad was an auto mechanic so it was like it makes sense he'd buy cars that were older and used and he could keep them running forever and fix stuff for cheap mm -hmm. and it was great you know and he would help us when we needed to fix stuff and so we could keep our cars running Re one time i had a car that i bought wasn't a great car i mean died he helped me rebuild the engine you know so mm -hmm. so uh, having that w is a huge luxury or yeah. benefit we didn't have that yeah i'm like i don't know this much about cars so what we do we went out and bought a used car for her when she graduated because she had to drive 40 some miles across town and i mm -hmm. wanted her to have something safe mm -hmm. so again i i don't love that but it's a practice and it's we've we've managed it well my mm -hmm. you know i've got a car right now my current car i bought three years ago almost to the day it'll be paid off in four months mm -hmm. we paid extra on it had i, I was mad when i got a three percent interest on a used car there's like three or three something he was i back at the back when i bought it, i was like wait a minute everybody's like 1.9 why am i paying three percent so that's the going rate for used cars i bought a used car I said, all right fine i pay extra on it I make the payment every week. There's so many things that you can do to save money. It's just, yeah. it's done. We could talk about them forever, but yeah. we're, and, we're coming up on time. I will ooh, say we're beyond time. So um, we could just sit yeah. here and talk about financial stuff forever. And it's probably boring. To people. I will say Miss Joy Hughes, uh, our, um, our old accountant. She, uh, she told me my first year I moved here. She goes, there is no one better with finances on earth than Tim Moore. That She's, is not true. And I, you are, you are, the, one of the most intentional and frugal human beings I've ever met in my life when it comes to money. I've had to fight frugality <laughs> my entire life. It really was, it came from my, my dad's side. We, like, he, they're cheap. He Does cheap. he have a nationality? But a lot of it, yeah. A, no, it wouldn't be that. A lot, a lot of it came from my dad grew up with nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say nothing. They were pretty poor. Mm -hmm. So when you grow up in that environment, you you know you treasure everything you, mm -hmm. you i mean they just they weren't 
Yeah, they that's were what, frugal. That's what and my dad so is. And so I just didn't pass down. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I never one of my actually one of my favorite memories of my dad was when randomly I still like we were in Iceland and we ended up going to this one restaurant. It was one of the best meals ever. But for whatever reason, it's one of those you, you ever just have those random conversations where you just go deep, mm. uh, deep conversation, and you just walk me through stuff either I didn't know or I'd forgotten about you know growing up in the area you grew up in like how this is form the way he thinks about money because he's you know very frugal and and, and um it isn't yeah you're right how you grow up really forms you mm. um yours just became hereditary well <laughs> and my, my my wife no I mean my kids have got it and so my wife was a good counterbalance she's not like she's not she's not frivolous with money mm-hmm. she really isn't mm-hmm. but she cares about experiences and this and you mm-hmm. know look, we need to go do this and so um it it did help counterbalance me a little bit. I mm-hmm. was way stricter before. I mean, you don't know strict. I was really, and we had to be. I, I mean, we were living on. on this <laughs> we, we were we were living on peanuts, and not going into debt. Mm-hmm. And and I and I'm grateful for it. But you know what? Yeah. We also didn't have cable TV. We had rabbit ears. A lot of people today they'll push back on mm-hmm. that. I'm going to be in debt, but they've got internet YouTube bills, TV, YouTube TV. They got their Apple iPhone TV, with all their – TV. Every Netflix. I got to have every streaming service. I got to have this. Mm-hmm. We, di- we didn't have that. You did mm-hmm. not have the money. Oh, yeah. People well, can find so much more margin if they want I to. feel like we could go <laughs> in a million more directions, but this has been good. We've uh, we, we, I feel, feel like we've hit a vein, and uh, we could go down either arm. <laughs> so, um, I think you're doing a fantastic job of getting your family's finances in a really good order. Thank you. I really do. It's been a you. It's you did not have a lot of that. We've talked about that. And you yeah. didn't have even. I says you didn't have great guidance even as you went to college and doing yeah. that. You've said that. If yes. that's okay to say. Yes. And ended up with a lot of student debt. Yes. And you would probably tell anybody. You would also agree, though, and I tell would. almost anybody if you can go to college and do whatever without student debt, you should. Oh, <laughs> the way we're going to parent our children and the way yeah. we think about this and live our life. I mean, there's. I've had to learn the hard way, and it's been a journey for us to get to the point where we're at. And I feel like we've, we're cresting a wave a little bit mm-hmm. to the point where we're we're getting to the point where I'm starting to see like. The fruit of our labors and light sense. at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, you guys are you're doing a great job for what yeah. for where, what you had and and kind of w- where you went. Yeah, to turning course and doing. I think you're doing a great job. So I want to encourage you with that. I don't yeah. think you probably hear that enough. I think you're you're doing a fantastic job of really Thank getting you. your family's finances in order. I think you really prioritize the right things, and I think it's it's a beautiful thing to see. Thanks. And you're going to be out of debt. And I'm going to go cry now. Huh? I'm going to go cry now. Oh. No, I'm just no yeah um and just encouraging by listening um the harsh man dave ramsey actually begins all of his conferences and talks with having people raise their hand have you ever done something stupid with money and then raises both of his hands and says this guy's done the most yeah Mm -hmm. so if if even the conversation the the conversation can make you feel a little bit of shame but yeah. All of us have done yes. stupid things with money, but all of us can start taking steps today yeah. towards a brighter future. Yeah. When it comes to how we handle it and God's there to help and he's for us yeah. and he's with yeah. us. And um hopefully this has been encouraging, informative, uh, for you. If it triggers any questions, thoughts, responses, send us in. Podcast at the X dot church. And so, a quick plug, yeah. I would encourage it. Anybody who watches this or listens to it before Sunday, March third. Yeah. To tune in or show up. It's going to be awesome. As we have a financial planner and a financial coach are going to join me. We're going to get to hear from them and some of the questions that people wrote in, which were really great questions about debt and saving, investment. And then next episode, hopefully, if everything works out, we're going to have them on this podcast. I'm going to have them on here to actually talk about a lot of the questions that we don't answer and get into some real details and practicals about finances. It'll be good. We'll plug. There we go. All right. Until then, we'll see you next week. Hey, guys, it's Russ. Thanks so much for listening. We really believe if we can get around tables instead of behind screens, if we can talk to each other instead of at each other, we can make the world better. To help us do that, here are a few things you can do to help. First, if you haven't yet, leave a review on Apple or Spotify and hit subscribe on YouTube. This helps more than you know. Also, if you have been impacted by the community out of which this podcast comes, that's X Church. Maybe you're local or you've been touched by the messages and impact across the country, even the world. I want to encourage you to support this work. 
A powerful life principle is to invest in the people and places that invest in you. And so I want to invite you to do that right now by going to the x.church slash give. You can give a one-time small gift, a sacrificial gift, or even become a recurring partner. Together, let's keep elevating the conversation, thinking higher, loving deeper, and making the world better. Cheers.